Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Cato. And thank you, Judy. Julie. See, I knew this was going to happen. First of all, her name's Julie. But secondly, let me just tell you that I'm so nervous to be at Cato that my dream last night in Julie's house, that's why I'm thanking Julie for putting me up, Julie Gunlock, who wrote From Cupcakes to Chemicals, which is another great book. Um, another great book, like mine is a great book. Um, uh, dreaming at her house, I woke up and I realized I had dreamt that I was just about to go on stage at a giant meeting and I um, was so hungry I ate peanut butter. Just a giant spoonful of peanut butter and then I had to go and give my speech. So I'm a little nervous today, but I didn't have peanut butter, um, which is great. Um, so, you may have heard of me because I'm also literally America's worst mom. Um, and when I say literally, I mean if you Google that, you find me there for, not that I Google myself obsessively, but if you do, <laughs> say somebody else Googled me and happened to tell me um, how many times I was there. I'm there for 77 pages, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> Followed by America's worst Mother's Day gift, which, um, there's some guys in the audience coming up, is, uh, let's see, a McDonald's gift certificate, although you could give one to me. And probably to Julie, because she, she likes chemicals. Um, and lingerie, that's for uh, Father's Day. And the collected um, works of the Three Stooges, which we have at our house. Anyways, let me cough, because even though it's not peanut butter, there's something there. <coughs> so America's worst mom or not, I'm a mom, which means that what do we do? I spend a lot of time talking to other moms. And a couple of years back, Huh, a couple. It was many years back at this point. But I was talking to my downstairs neighbor. I lived in Manhattan at the time in a you know, tall building. And um, my neighbor was looking at me with such consternation. And she was saying, Lenore, can you believe she did that? And I'm like, did what? What are we talking about, Melissa? What are you talking about? And well, it turned out that Melissa had been at Costco shopping with her own two little daughters who were um, like five and two at the time. And they were waiting in line to check out. And the lady behind her tapped her on the shoulder and said, excuse me, would you mind watching my little baby son for a minute? I, I have to go get enough tuna for Armageddon um, or whatever. Um, you know, it's like, OK. She'd forgotten the tuna, as do we all. And so Melissa said, sure, I'll do that. And the lady went. And that's when Melissa turned to me and said, can you believe she did that? And I'm like, you know, we all forget things at Costco. It's all in brown boxes. It's not like a nice, normal store. And she's like, no, Lenore. I could have taken her baby, and she would never have seen him again. Whoa! I'm like, Melissa, that's what you were so mad about? And she's like, yes. And she was so angry. I said, OK, let me just walk through this with you for a minute. And, and I literally have to walk because I pace all the time. But anyway, so, so, so um, for you to um, steal her baby uh, would require a couple things. First of all, uh, you would have to be a Kidnapper, <laughs> right? Um, uh, one of the few with two small children of your own <laughs> at home already, but, but maybe one of the boy, OK? OK, grant that. So um, <clears throat> you would have been pursuing this goal using the rather slow yield method of <laughs> waiting for somebody to give you one in public. <laughs> but it's your lucky day. OK, so, so now, let's see, you have to grab the child out of the cart, and then you have your own two children and your own cart. And you have to start going by everyone, excuse me, excuse me, we're going, I have to leave, I got this thing, I can't believe it, it was my lucky day. Um, and then your children are going like, wait a minute, mom, what about all those goldfish crackers? We were going to get a mountain of goldfish crackers, what are we going to do with that? And then the, the little baby is saying, like, not the little baby, your little kid is going, this, I'm the baby. I'm the baby in this family, what are you doing? <coughs> leaving, you know, leaving our cart, leaving our food. And it's like, shut up, I got to get you out of here. And so, so you're taking the baby and the other baby and the one who's mad and the one who wants the goldfish crackers and you're going by everyone, excuse me, excuse me. You get to the, the door and I don't know maybe DC is a nicer place, but in New York when you get to the door, there's what? There's a lady who's checking to see, did you steal anything? <laughs> it's like, yes, we stole that lady's baby. And it's like, and I'm the baby. It's like, shut up. OK, you go back, no, nothing. We're not taking anything that um, has a price tag. OK, so <clears throat> out you go. And then you're facing this vast parking lot. And you're a little nervous, because it's your first felony. And so <clears throat> you're thinking, what am I going to do? I go, beep, 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 beep. There's the car. Hooray. OK, so you go to the car. And you open up that gigantic door, right? And then you, you put your, your five-year-old gets in the seat belt. And then the two-year-old you're putting in the, in the car seat. And then you don't have a car seat for the baby.
maybe, right? The money, that, that's against the law. <laughs> so, so then you have to make a car seat out of like a, a, I don't know, a lunchbox or a laundry basket or something. And then like, well, how old is he? Because should you be fitting forward? You know, you don't really know. And is he shooting backwards? And there's the new laws. And in California, it's different. And then what are you going to give them to eat? And it's like one wants a snack and one wants a sippy cup. And do we watch Dora? Or now we have a boy. Should we watch SpongeBob? You know, you just don't know what to do. And finally, you get everybody satisfied, or at least wailing. And then you get in, <coughs> and you Put on your car, you know, your, your seat belt, you adjust your mirror, put on Disney radio, and then you gun it across state lines, <laughs> never to come home again with three children under the age of five, and that's considered a real danger. Okay, that, that's my question for us today. Who's crazy? Who's crazy? The woman who thinks that, that she was, that this lady was wrong? To, to let anybody trust her child in public, or I think I flipped that around, but who's crazy? Melissa's crazy. <laughs> Long and short of it, Melissa is crazy to think that that was a real danger and that the woman was being irresponsible, bordering on negligent, which is where the law comes in. And, <clears throat> and now I'm realizing I don't have any water. Anybody has any water? Oh, I do have water. Poison water. Um, no, it's okay. Um, or should we start realizing that maybe our children are not in constant danger? Mm. I thought that, oh, I do have my own bottle. <laughs> now Walter has none. <clears throat> and a spoonful of peanut butter for him. Um, so, so I wrote a column about that because it struck me as such a strange moment in American sociology, right? The fact that we think that a child would be in danger with another mother in public for a good two minutes. And I thought this was going to set the world on fire. I put it in the Daily News. And I got three emails. And two of them said, like, you sound like somebody you know, who might be America's worst mom someday. No, they didn't say that. But they didn't agree with me. And then I always have this one elderly admirer on Staten Island um, who would write to me uh, for every column. And he wrote, um, you're not crazy, but I'm crazy for Skenazy which I appreciated, but still, it did not set the world on fire. So, go on living my life. I actually got fired from the Daily News. <laughs> Don't ever buy the Daily News. Um, and uh, I ended up in the New York Sun, and when I was there, uh, I have two sons, one who never gets mentioned, who didn't ask to ride the subway, so I'll mention him now. His name is Maury. Um, and then the son, who I only talk about, and Maury resents the hell out of it, um, who did one day come up to my husband and me and say, could you take me someplace I've never been and let me find my own way home on the subway? Yeah, like this. I'm looking like that. That's what we did. We looked at him, too. It's like, huh? But that's what he wanted to do. And he was persistent enough that we started talking about it, my husband, who was never referred to as America's worst dad, and I. <clears throat> and we thought, well, let's think. He wants to do this. We're on the subway all the time, right? We, we see that it's crowded, which I think makes it safe. Um, he knows how to read a map. He speaks the language. Not that everybody does, but he does. And, um, and he's ready to do it. So OK, let's let him. So one sunny Sunday, I took him to Bloomingdale's, which was a place we had never been before. <laughs> Shows where I shopped. Um, and, uh, and I left him in the handbag department. I told him what was going on first. Um, and, but the handbag department seemed like a funny place. Like, oh, I forgot. I was just so interested in my Birkin bag. Um, and, uh, but actually, if you leave somebody in the handbag department um, and they're sentient being, uh, they can open the door, and there's the subway. It's right there outside. So I went the other way, and he went down into the bowels of New York, um, and he went to one of those scary things that you're never supposed to talk to, a uh, stranger. <laughs> That's right, a man, even. Um, and he said, is this the way downtown? And the guy said, oh, perfect for Melissa. A little old, but no, no, right? No. The guy said, no, you got to go up and over and down. And, um, and that's what Izzy did. And so he took the subway down, I don't know, like four stops or something, to 34th Street. Miracle on 34th Street, he emerged unscathed. Um, and then he had to take a bus home. And when he got home, he was just so happy. You know, he felt ready for this thing. And he'd done it. He felt like a grown up. And I gave him some cigarettes. No. Um, <laughs> he felt really good. Um, but me with this keen nose for news, um, honed from you know 14 years of the Daily News, which fired me, to um, uh, I didn't think of writing a column immediately because I hadn't done this as some grand experiment. It didn't strike me as that newsworthy. It was just a thing in our family. Boy, has it become a thing in our family. But anyways, um, so about a month and a half later, uh, I was staring at the computer screen with nothing to write about. And I said to my editor, I said, maybe 
should I write about Izzy taking the subway at nine? You know, I talked to some of the other fourth grade moms and they said that they would wait a little longer till like their kid was like 28, 29. <laughs> um, and she said, sure, why don't you write about it? Sounds like a nice local story. Local. Okay, so that, am I like in the wrong place here? Can I just keep pacing in front of Walter here? You keep pacing. Okay, so that night the phone rings. And, and I get on this guy, and I don't know who will recognize this name here, but if you do, be embarrassed. It was, um, it was Joey Boots. Anyone know who Joey Boots is? Of course not a Cato. It's Howard Stern's guy. He's on, oh, somebody's, oh, now you're admitting it. Okay, okay, fine. So it's Howard Stern's guy. He's like, what are you calling me for? Howard Stern? <laughs> you know? It's like, you know, when I dance around a pole, it's the first of May. <laughs> right? And has he seen me? You know? I don't know. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm straight. I'm married. I'm so boring. I haven't gotten high. What are you calling me for? Um, and he said, well, that story you wrote about uh, your kid, that sounded like something Howard would be interested in. I'm like, Howard's interested in me? OK. And I hung up. <laughs> and, then, and then the phone rang again. And this was. The Today Show. I'm like, oh, you know, Howard. No, How great. And I'm thinking, like, you know, what is the nexus between these two news outlets? Um, I felt Kardashian, <laughs> right? It's like, who would possibly be of interest to both of them? Or, or you know, it's just an odd feeling. But in the end, um, Howard spurned me. Maybe that's for the best. I never ended up on Howard's show. But two days after I had written this Subway column, I ended up on um, the Today Show. MSNBC, Fox News, and for contrast, NPR. I don't know why I'm pointing, pointing to Walter for NPR. Um, but I found myself on all those shows um, trying to defend the fact that I had believed in my son. What a cardinal sin. Um, and the apotheosis of this was um, one guy who'd called up the, the NPR show. He sounded like an elderly man. And he wanted to know why that woman me, like, like Clinton, that woman, um, why had that woman wanted to give her son uh, one day of possible fun and adventure that could easily end up with him um, oh, sodomized, uh, burned, thrown on the tracks, decapitated, murdered, um, <clears throat> when she could have chosen to give him a long and happy life? And I'm like, well, sir, uh, you know, six of one, half a dozen of another. And, you know, I have a column to write. And did I mention I have a spare son at home? Uh, so, so the fact that anybody would be thinking of me this way um, made me run and start my blog, the Free Range Kids blog, that weekend. Because I wanted to explain that, like, I'm not, I'm nervous. This isn't fake nervous. This is nervous. I'm a nervous mom. I believe in helmets and car seats and seat belts, and um, if you ever invite me to a baby shower, I always bring the same gift. It is a fire extinguisher, <laughs> which is a great idea. Don't steal it. Um, so, so the idea that I would be like uh, considered evil Knievel of moms was so bizarre to me that I wanted to explain that. All I, all I believe in is that I don't think children need a security detail every time they leave the home. Well. Until that moment, and people started to write to me, I hadn't realized what kind of moment we were in, in America, in terms of fear for our children. And, and um, so that's how I found out, because I was living in Manhattan, that around the country, parents were now driving their children to the school bus stop. Did you know that? I mean, maybe it's happening here. OK, I didn't know that at the time. And then they wait to make sure the transfer is successful <laughs> you know, from the SUV to the bus, oh, phew, and then they could drive home. And then there are places around the country where the school bus doesn't even stop at the school bus stop anymore. It goes to each individual house. The kids are like vomiting by, by the time they get there. We had 50 stops. Um, and, um, and, and then there are, um, there are parents who will drive their child, because now the kid is being picked up in front of the house, from the garage to the sidewalk. Because, you know, anything can happen. That's our favorite phrase. Anything could happen. It's like, yeah, they could lose a calorie. You, you know, oh my god, he lost a calorie. He'll never get it back. So, um, so I didn't know how strange this was. And then that's just, that's just to get the kid to school. And by the way, what did we used to call the beginning of school? It was arrival, right? And what was the end of school? It was dismissal. And what is it now? It's drop off and pick up, because the kids have become 
FedEx packages. <laughs> you know, you have to get them there, and you have to pick them up, and you'll get them there on time, and you're going to do it right, and you get low wages, but you're going to do it. So, so after school, here's what starts happening. About half an hour before school lets out, the line of cars starts going down the block and around the corner and down the block and around Walter until finally, here you are, and they're all waiting. They're waiting for the big moment when, ding, 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 finally. OK, it's not dismissal time. It's pickup time. OK, so they have to organize all the kids from the school. So there's the bus kids, the kids nobody cares about. Those, those kids go over here. And then the rest of the children, the beloved ones, um, get gathered in the auditorium or the gym or the cafeteria. And then they're huddled masses, yearning to be free. They're not allowed out. But then the first car comes up, and somebody outside with a walkie-talkie, this happens, this happens across the country, comes up and, and the car drives up and there's a nameplate on the dashboard and it says Ava. And so the lady up there, I always think she's the gym teacher, goes, okay, Ava's mom is here, Ava's mom is here. And they go, okay, Ava's mom is here. Ava H or Ava P? Ava H, Ava P, okay, Ava P, your mom is here. Okay, and then they grab the kid and they bring her and they go up the stairs and they go outside and they open the door and they shove her in like Obama, you know. <laughs> okay, there you go. Okay, now who's coming up? Okay, it's Oliver. Oliver, your mom is here. Oh, Eli, Eli, your mom is here. Timmy, Timmy, your mom is here. And they're just coming up and they're getting in. And I, all I can imagine is like, you know, guns gunning and snipers sniping and bombs exploding and helicopters whirring. And it's like, it's like the fall of Saigon. Go, go, for God's sake, go while you can. Get out! <laughs> And that's happening every day after school across America in the suburbs that parents moved to. Why? Why? Why did they move there? To raise their kids in some nice, safe place. So to which I always say, gee, why don't you just raise them in a slum? Because you could save a lot on rent, and you're going to be taking them anywhere, everywhere anyhow. So, so when I realized that was going on, I have to take a sip here. Did you take yours back? <laughs> Did you yours. lick mine? I took, right, I right. took an unused one for safety's sake. Mm. Boy, so much goes on behind my back. So that's when I realized something strange was going on in America. Um, but it's not just all about safety. People were writing to my site with other new I mean, it is all about safety, but it's not all about just school. People write into my site telling me that, um, like in Girl Scouts, you're still allowed to toast a marshmallow, but you have to have one knee on the ground. Why? <laughs> so you don't immolate all the children. Oh, I'm in St. Joan of Arc troop. How about you? You know, it's like, it's like kids couldn't possibly do this thing safely anymore. I talked to one mom. Her son was in Cub Scouts. And the leader came, and he was demonstrating how you whittle, you know, which I think we, you, and you remember whittling at this point. Um, so you will. Um, so so uh, when he was done with the demonstration, which, you know, you use a knife and a piece of wood, or at least traditionally, um, maybe now you use a video. Um, he, he gave each and every child what? A knife? Are you kidding? <laughs> no, that wouldn't illustrate my point. No. Uh, he gave each individual child a potato peeler. OK? Now, can you imagine our proud Native American forebears? I've been working on this totem pole for like seven years. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's like a popsicle stick. You need a knife to whittle. I actually think it's safer to use a knife to whittle than this potato peeler, because first of all, you're not so frustrated you killed a Cub Scout leader. But also, you can get somewhere. So, but because we middle-aged people um, have a tendency to always look back and say, ah, today's crazy. In my day, everything was much better. Um, I had to find a smoking gun that proved it wasn't just my imagination um, that things had changed dramatically in a generation or a generation and a half. And I did. I found it. Um, if you get the DVD collections, two DVDs, called Sesame Street Old School, you will see all sorts of wonderful old stuff from 69 to 74, which is the first five years um, it was on TV. And so you see kids playing Follow the Leader. And the leader, believe it or not, does not have a PhD in leadership studies. <laughs> it's, it's another five-year-old. Um, you see them playing in a vacant lot. And um, they balance like this. I'm sure I'm out of the light. They balance on something like this. Well, can you imagine? Ah! Now I'm going to sue Cato. Yay! Koch brothers. Yay! Um, no. So, 
They show kids on the playground, uh, not playground, it's not a playground, it's not even soft and squishy on the ground. Um, they go through one of those giant pipes, um, straight shot, there's no like homeless guy in the middle. They go shimmying through the pipe and they come out on the other end. The kids are frolicking, okay? It's as simple as that. But before you see any of that, at the very beginning of the DVD, a warning appears on the screen and it says, <clears throat> The following is intended for adult viewing only and may not be suitable for younger viewers. <laughs> like it's porn, okay? Sesame Street qua porn. I mean, it's just amazing to me because these were not like silly Super 8 videos that somebody just decided to throw on air. These were, this was supposed to model a halcyon childhood and Joan Gans Cooney and the rest of the gang of the psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers and teachers endorsed this as a healthy childhood, and now it's too dangerous to even show children. And if you ask me afterwards, I have like another million examples of the way Sesame Street itself has changed. But to me, that proved that something had gone very wrong with our society to the point where, and these are my little Cato points I wanted to point out, to the point where, how did we get to this point where A, now, good Samaritans call 911 when they see what? A child outside. <laughs> a child walking, a child playing, a child on their way to get pizza, a child at the playground. Okay, they call 911, and worse, the cops come. Okay, how do we get to that point? How do we get to the point where a daycare center has been around since 1981, it's rural, it's in New Jersey. I, I know that sounds contradictory. But um, uh, the woman who run that, ran that daycare called me because the inspectors had come, and they told her that she had to chop off all the branches on the trees up to um, seven feet high because now they were no longer considered branches, they were overgrown vegetation. Okay, how do we get to the point where these are the rules for a science fair in Colorado? For your safety, products may not, may not contain any of the following. No organisms, living or dead. No microbial cultures, fungi, molds, bacteria, parasites. No chemicals, no flammable substances, and no plants in soil. <laughs> okay, that's, those are the real rules at the science fair, I think in Boulder, Colorado. So nothing is safe enough, although children are concerned, and I wanted to find out how come. 